Hello everyone, welcome back for some more video lectures on um, critical reasoning, critical thinking. Uh, today we're going to get started with the chapter 2 material and our focus on linguistic analysis, um, which is part of this uh, first unit of the class. Everything that's gearing up for exam 1, as I mentioned before, is focused around um, listening and just being able to understand what people are saying. Arguing is a communication activity and we want to uh, develop our skills in that regard too as a way to set up and prepare for the stage of evaluating arguments. So you can't evaluate something you don't understand, so that's where we begin. Um, but before I get started with that material and um, what is the content from what's called Lecture 1 uh, in Canvas, I wanted to uh, clarify something about the assignments that I, I heard from a couple students about, so I just thought I would talk about it with everybody. Um, just to make sure everything is super clear about how this works. And it's about the homework assignment. So uh, I'm here on the modules page from the Canvas site. Um, you can see here the sidebar. I'm going to move the window a little bit here so you can see it better. And here is the getting started module. And then here we are in language of arguments. Um, so this is our first like official unit of course material. And you'll see um, there's the homework for chapter two assignment. And that assignment, uh, if you click on it, it'll show you the instructions. So the, the text box here that provides the description of the assignment actually provides the instructions for what I want you to do. Um, I will tell you which exercises are assigned. Uh, I'll tell you sometimes I'll have you skip problems, or there are some that are required, but you can do the other ones optionally. Um, and in many cases, I will either adjust the instructions or give you some advice about how to attack them um, in addition to what the book is saying about it. And that's happening here for the chapter 2 homework. Um, I have a very important note here on the bottom that says on the exam it's not going to look quite like it looks in the homework because I'll be asking five total questions here for this for the section of the exam that's focused on this material that we're doing here today and on Thursday. Um, so I'll be asking these five questions. What's the literal meaning? What's the implied meaning? What's the speech act? What's the conversational act? And how's the implication generated with regard to a particular snippet or sampling of a conversation? So it might be a good idea to practice answering all five of those questions with the homework problems that are provided from the book rather than just sticking to the instructions that are listed there. So always check this out first. Always go to the actual homework assignment itself um, to figure out uh, what I, how I want you to proceed about this and what I want you to do with it. Going back to the modules page, um, you'll also see uh, this um, file attachment that says homework exercises for chapter 2.pdf. So this is a PDF that has the scans from the book itself. Uh, that have the actual problems that I want you to be working on. Um, I've provided this because the way I've set up the class, I, I haven't required a particular edition of the book. And the goal here has been to uh, make it so that you can get the cheapest thing available, whether that's the, uh, the main edition that I'm working with or some other edition. The older editions are usually cheaper, so I've stuck with 8th edition, even though this text has newer editions of it. So if students have different editions of the book, the homework exercises are sometimes numbered differently. Some of them have been updated or changed, like they're different problems. So I give you this PDF so that we're all on the same page about what exercises we're doing, um, regardless of what edition of the text you have. Uh, and it's these problems that are the ones I'll be giving out answers for, too. So if you're looking at my answer sheet when I post that, and it's like talking about things that are totally different from the problems you worked on, it probably means you were working with a different edition. So those are the kind of two things to be looking at um, for doing these homework assignments. Go to the actual assignment where you'll upload your answers and you'll see a description of everything I want you to do with possibly some adjustments or advice and then use the PDF provided so that we're all doing the same problems. Uh, and that's how that's going to work. Um, there, I also should note um, when I was trying to open up all the course content so that there were some students who wanted access to some of the materials a little earlier than when we're going to get around to them in the class. Um, when I published everything, there were some goofy things that happened, including a bunch of automatically assigned due dates for things that are not accurate at all. So I, thankfully, a student uh, made some noise to me about it. I didn't catch it right away. 
and I've gone in and removed all the due dates from all that stuff so hopefully your calendar looks a little more sensible than what it looked like when I first uh, opened everything up yesterday. So my apologies for any panic I induced there uh, on the part of any few for seeing like all these assignments coming down the pipe way too fast. Um, so I I'm sorry about that. But um, I do have everything now published. Uh, you'll notice none of the um, lectures, are, lectures are up there because they, again, haven't been recorded yet. Um, this was another thing I wanted to mention to everybody. So uh, as I said in the welcome video, I wanted to make this class uh, as much as possible to emulate or reflect what it would be like to take the class if it was an in-person, on-campus class. And mostly because uh, there's a kind of pedagogical reason for this or justification for it is because I think to succeed in this class, uh, to give yourself the best, for, to have students have the best chance of success in learning and mastering this material, it does take regular contact with the class. Um, so not just like one day out of the week that you do stuff for the class, but on, on a sort of regular schedule to it. And also I think I get better with my lecturing over the years and, um, and I like to also be responsive in my video lectures to where students are at. So sometimes my lectures change based on the students I have that quarter um, and what's going on with them. And so I like to be here with you rather than to just have a class that's full of canned lectures. So um, I do have lecture videos for the entire class recorded from when I taught this class three years ago. Um, and they're up on YouTube. There's a playlist on my channel that has uh, lecture videos 115, something like that. Um, so if you want to, or because of circumstances this quarter, you have to uh, get a, a, some uh, contact with the material sooner than I'm recording these lectures, that is a resource that you can use. Um, and I was thinking about, like, you know, what should be my policy about this, if anything. And, and I think what, what I've sort of settled on is that I'm just going to make all those resources available to you. I highly recommend watching the lectures I'm going to be recording now, like this quarter, rather than using the old ones. But I'm like, you're adults and you can self-manage and make choices. So I'm not going to, in a draconian way, sort of decide that stuff for you. So um, I'm not going to be too paternalistic about it. I'll, I'll, you've got it all available to you, so you can use it. Some of you might have even found the playlist without me mentioning it um, by just going to my YouTube channel and seeing it. Um, but yeah, I, I will still make the recommendation that you uh, watch the videos that I'm recording live uh, this quarter. And uh, another thing I wanted to just emphasize because I talked to a couple people about it, um, I really do, I, I mentioned it, but it's worth emphasizing. I do encourage you to procrastinate on the homework. In other words, don't do the homework until after you've watched the lecture videos for that unit. Um, there's a lot of things I'm going to be adding to supplement what the book has got going on that you'll see behind me on the whiteboard here. Um, I've got this chart set up and this chart is like uh, extrapolating and integrating a lot of the stuff that is in the text material that in a way I think that'll not only be more accessible to you but also more like practically functional like when you're working on um, the homework problems uh, when you're trying to actually implement and wield in application the principles techniques of analysis that we're using um, uh, that you're getting sort of theoretically from the text so and, and there's some cases in which I offer something radically different you'll see that next week um, when we get into uh, well maybe next week or the week after when we get into the chapter 5 material um, I'm going to teach a method for argumentative reconstruction that is not in the book at all. And so uh, you, you'll want to avail yourself of those resources too. So uh, that's some preliminary stuff. Uh, we got some people in chat. Oh, uh, in case you're wondering, people are watching this on YouTube later. Um, I'm going to be sticking mostly to um, this view of my webcam uh, that's in this tiny little minimized picture window. Um, and that's because I haven't been able to figure out a way um, in the settings of Skype uh, to unmirror my video when it's up. I'll show you what I mean. Okay, let's pull it up again. See, when I got the full video, everything is mirrored. And that diagram is going to look really obnoxious. Um, this might work out OK until I have to talk about that. Um, so then I'll go back to the minimized view because it goes unmirrored when that happens. 
I will attempt to research this and figure out a way to solve it. Um, last time I did this recording, I did it on, on Google Hangouts three years ago. So I know my way around that. I was able to find a couple quick answers on the internet, but they didn't end up working. Uh, the, the Skype interface has, maybe has been changed or something. But I'll figure that out for next time um, so we don't have to deal with this. But hopefully you'll still be able to see what's going on with that chart. And I'll be talking through everything here as we go, of course, too. Um, people in chat, any questions with uh, any of that introductory stuff? Okay, cool. Yeah, Trav, so you, you see it okay, but I don't. <laughs> and the people watching on YouTube are getting a basically a screen cap of what I'm seeing with the video recorder I'm using. Okay, nothing else you guys are wondering about? You're, you're my uh, canaries in the coal mine for the rest of the class, so don't be shy about asking questions or jumping in. Okay, um, so let's get started. Um, in case you people in chat want to be following along, I am working off of lecture one here. Um, and we've got some, before we get into the, the real nuts and bolts of the linguistic analysis, we do have some big picture things to talk about. I'm going to try to do this a, a little more quickly um, so that we can get to the, the real exciting stuff. I mean, not that this stuff isn't exciting, but um, I want to get to the more detailed stuff that's relevant for what you're going to be trained for the exam. But we've already talked about the real big preliminaries of uh, approaching a critical thinking class, like defining what an argument is. So as we talked about before, an argument is just a claim supported by other claims. We're not talking about argument in the maybe more informal sense of people fighting with each other or anything like that. Um, we're talking about arguments as just these abstract entities of conclusions supported by premises. And the act of arguing is just to present an argument, to make an argument. That's it. Uh, we'll be sticking with that thin definition um, for the rest of the class. Um, it, there is a question here about what support means. And the basic idea here, as I got in the lecture notes, is it support means justifies believing it. So if my premises support my conclusion, then that means the truth of the premises justifies me in believing the conclusion and accepting the conclusion, the claim that the conclusion is making. Um, conclusions and premises, uh, this is a good little detail to point out. Conclusions and premises are not um, intrinsically, uh, uh, the claims that they're, that they're composed of are not intrinsically premises or conclusions. It's not like some claims are premises and some claims are conclusions. Rather, the status of something being a premise or being a conclusion is just the role that it's playing in an argument. So if a claim is providing support, we'll call it a premise. If it's receiving support, we'll call it a conclusion. A really good analogy for this idea is um, the relationship of uh, parents and children. So uh, a parent, it, what it means to be a parent is just that you're in a certain asymmetrical role with regard to another human being. Uh, to be a parent, you must have a child. To be a child, you have a parent. So in a similar way, um, the way in which uh, I'm a parent for my child, which I do have a child, um, I'm also the child of my parents. And you can do this with arguments. You can have premises that justify a conclusion, but then that conclusion of that argument is a premise for drawing another conclusion. So in one argument, it's a premise. It's serving as a premise. It's playing that role. In another argument, it's serving as a conclusion, and it's playing that role. Um, so I hope that, that might, might clear up some possible confusion. Chat, that making sense to you? Uh, for anyone who's in the chat, I'm just checking in. Since you're here, I'm going to take advantage of you. Make sense? Okay, cool. Um, I'll do that periodically here and check in and see if, if what I'm throwing down is making sense to you. So um, those are arguments. Uh, but what does justification look like? What, the, what does rational justification mean? Um, 
there's a few different uh, well, there's two really big ideas of how we sometimes cash out what justifies mean or what it means to have a reason to believe something. Um, the most classical sort of definition would be rational justification aimed at truth. So we're trying to figure out what is true. And only those things which provide some evidence uh, um, or support for thinking something is true counts here. And other things don't. So I've got this distinction in the lecture notes here that says uh, pragmatic constraints often provide a reason to treat a belief as if it was true, but not a reason to think that the belief is true. And by pragmatic constraints, I really mean things like practical considerations. So uh, I don't know if anyone reads Peanuts anymore, the old Charlie Brown comic. Um, it was something I, I had when I was growing up. Uh, but there's a really famous uh, little strip where Lucy and Charlie Brown are talking to each other, and Lucy's trying to convince Charlie Brown of something. Charlie Brown is like, what reason do I have to believe what you're saying or to agree with you? And Lucy says, I'll give you five reasons. One, two, three, four, five. So things like bullying uh, or a fallacy we'll talk about later, appeal to force or threat, um, might be able to provide a motivation for you to believe something, or to act as if you believe it, to like publicly assent to it or support it or something like that. Um, but it can't give you a reason to think that something really is true. I've got another example for you. Um, I've been uh, interested in um, uh, exploring more of what's a historical blind spot for me, uh, the Dark Ages, especially in philosophy, it's like, there's a, a nasty tendency for people to just be like, there's ancient philosophy, and then we jump to the Enlightenment and just skip over all the stuff in between. Roman philosophy is not very interesting. Um, and then the Dark Ages happens. Uh, and in, in the Dark Ages in France, think like um, this is almost post-apocalyptic. Right? Like all the um, main like uh, authorities or structuring institutions of society have like broken down or are compromised. Um, and so it's kind of like an anarchic free-for-all for a while, especially in France. And uh, the church is, at this point, is like, um, it's in a difficult position in some ways. It's trying to recover and protect civilization from being completely lost. So this is where, you, if you know about like monks uh, copying down t ancient texts and trying to preserve them. And it's really interesting to have all these like religious figures who are really big on people like Aristotle. They, they refer to Aristotle as just the philosopher. They don't even use his name. They're like, we all, you all know who I'm talking about. Kind of thing. But anyway, the church is definitely trying to kind of rebuild some stability to society for some good reasons and for some bad reasons. And one of their bad choices is definitely, in my opinion at least, is they basically try to, uh, they, they give um, a bunch of warlords who are kind of rolling around, kind of like Mad Max style, um, they give them their endorsement as a way of trying to create some kind of stability, some social stability. But what you end up getting when you have warlords with a religious justification behind them or endorsement is that they're going around uh, to villages forcing people to convert to Christianity under pain of death. So if you got like an ax over your head and someone's like, do you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? The acts might be able to motivate you to say yes, but it'd be very strange to say something like, the presence of this threat to my life is itself evidence that Jesus truly is my Lord and Savior. Like, Jesus is so concerned about having a relationship with me that he sent this warlord to me to threaten me in order to give me a motivation to accept faith. I mean, that seems really goofy to say, right? That's, that kind of thing is not the kind of justification that we're talking about for this class. Um, a motivation won't count. And there can be a whole lot of things that count in that direction that are not as blatantly bad or coercive as this like that Dark Ages case that I'm bringing up. Um, like even things appeal to self-interest is another one. To give someone a motivation to agree to something based on how it'll benefit them also doesn't provide the kind of justification that we're looking at here, at least in cases where there's something else that's uh, important other than just that person's self-interest for themselves. So uh, maybe that gets you in the ballpark. People in chat, is this making sense to you? Do you want to hear anything more about this 
I, uh, distinction between reasons to think something is true versus a reason to accept the belief as if it was true. Is that going pretty good? Good so far? Okay. Does everyone have a good sound? I have some noises on the background. Don't hear Professor pretty good. Trying to fix it. Um, how's that, everyone else doing? I don't think I'm in a classroom all by myself here, so I don't think there's a lot of background noise. Yeah. Maybe the internet connection issue. Okay. Okay, cool. All right, so um, moving on here. I, I have this little bit here in my lecture notes about pragmatism with a capital P. And this is a philosophical position. Um, I can kind of describe it like um, there, in the history of philosophy, if, if any of you have studied philosophy before, you might know how hard it is to sometimes get at the truth. And there's a lot of skeptical concerns out there about our ability to have knowledge um, in just in general. And so there, with those skeptical concerns in mind, there was a sort of philosophical movement, you might say. Uh, it was kind of a new um, research uh, proposal or direction. It's been, and that's pragmatism. Pragmatism has been called the only genuinely American philosophy because all the rest of the philosophy we do is like imported from other cultures across the planet. A lot of stuff from Europe, um, in a, at least in America here. And uh, but but this idea of pragmatism is like, well, maybe the truth is just not graspable. So let's go with the next best thing. They're kind of like truth, whatever. Let's go with what works. What uh, so rational justification would look for the pragmatist something more like, whatever um, whatever thing a belief is justified if believing in it or endorsing it as a belief is functionally useful for a certain end or project or purpose. Um, so it gives up on the notion of like truth in itself and it's just about pr what practically works. Okay, um, And it might sound like a pretty bold move. I mean it is a bold move to do that. Um, but the pragmatist is not just thinking about practical issues like putting food on the table. It's thinking about things that are of like theoretical science. Like um, who knows if the laws uh, and forces that modern scientific theory presents are actually true, like that's how things actually are. We don't really know. We're not in a position maybe to confirm that. Um, but we can say we're rationally justified in believing it because when we operate in the world, in our lives, with those assumptions or with those beliefs, we're able to build bridges that don't fall down. Uh, we're able to get to the moon. We're able to do all these other sorts of things. So. It's kind of like pragmatism is saying everything comes down to whether it's a useful fiction or a not useful fiction, but there's no nonfiction. Um, pragmatism is a pretty extreme view. Um, I've been somewhat sympathetic to it in the past, but it isn't really giving up on this standard of truth, and that's the kind of big thing I'd want to emphasize. Uh, this is a little bit of a tangent. It, this is the kind of thing that I, I mentioned there will at various places get into things of more philosophical controversy. This is one of them. And if you're curious about it and want to hear more, I would be very happy to talk to you about it outside of class. For our purposes in this lecture today, all I really need to say is that the pragmatist move, this is almost a slogan of pragmatism at this point. Uh, people say, pragmatism doesn't really change anything. It leaves all the details of how people are making arguments or doing science, it leaves that all basically intact. It doesn't disturb anything. All it's doing is reframing our understanding of what we're doing when we're exerting ourselves as critical reasoners or as trying to like get at the truth. It's just we're not getting at the truth in the way we might have thought about it traditionally in philosophy. Instead we're getting at something that's the most useful. Um, and I, I, Maybe this is also a cool detail to get into. Um, pragmatism also when it's talking about what works, it's not just thinking about technology and building bridges and things like that. The biggest uh, pragmatic project that most pragmatists endorse is the desire to, or the, the, motive, the project, the purpose 
of finding a way to think about our experiences in a way that unifies them without contradiction, being able to make sense of experience, to give explanations for things. That's a pragmatic project too. So it's not like under pragmatism all scientists need to be only working on research projects that generate new technologies. The whole idea of knowledge for knowledge's sake still survives in pragmatism. And I think, I would argue, maybe I'll do a little of this, that the distinction I just offered as um, two different forms of justification, something that gives me reasons to think something truly is true versus just a reason to treat it as if it was true, that distinction also survives the pragmatist turn or the pragmatist reframing. Even a pragmatist recognizes the difference between an argument that's appealing only to, say, self-interest versus other considerations. That's like integrating other concerns. Um, or a distinction between the reasons why I might authentically have faith versus something like coercive bullying. Right? Those are in different buckets for the pragmatist too. They might have to do a little bit more of a song and dance about how to define that distinction, but I think it does survive. Um, that, and I'll leave the tangent there. Uh, we, there's a lot more I could say about that, and like I said, if you want to talk more with me about it outside of class, I would love to, um, but we can keep moving here. But I, I wanted to acknowledge that this is a point of controversy in philosophy. Um, how to understand truth itself is really pesky. Um, this class is focused on, oh, this, this is a good time to talk about this. I was going to do this sooner or later. Let's do it now. So I mentioned before that when we're thinking about standards for good arguments, there really are just two. I can sum up like the whole gamut of logic uh, and critical thinking with just this very simple set of two standards. An argument is a good argument if, one, its premises are all true, and two, it has a good support relation. And we're going we're gonna to understand a good support relation in terms of two possible standards. One is deductive validity, and we're going to have a unit on that in this class. And the other one is inductive strength, and we're going to have a unit on that in this class too. So we're really going to dive in to how to evaluate the logic of arguments, the support relation between premises and the conclusions they're attempting to justify. But there is that other standard. The premises have to be true. And that's a field of epistemology. Um, to, to answer that kind of question. How do we have any knowledge of anything is a question for epistemology. We're not going to get into it. That's a big, big can of worms, and if you're interested in it, I highly recommend taking Philosophy 101. You'll definitely get some contact, uh, like an introduction to epistemology there. Um, but that's one of the kind of outstanding issues of like, how do we know that things are true at all? Another issue that shows up in a 101 class, and that's a big topic in philosophy, and we're not going to get into it very much in this class, is what is truth? What is the nature of truth itself? I actually had a couple conversations with some students uh, in the last week about um, relativism. Um, <clears throat> this class is, I mean, any kind of class that, it, or any paradigm that has rigorous standards of critical thinking involved with it automatically rejects relativism. Uh, I'm not going to go into a big spiel about relativism now, uh, in this lecture today. Uh, again, if you want to talk to me about it, we can do that. But um, the 101 class, especially the one I teach here at Bellevue College, uh, that's kind of like the central theme. And that's a metaphysical question. So philosophy is like metaphysics, epistemology, and ethics, and logic is in, and then there's a bunch of other <clears throat> more minor constellations of studying philosophy. Philosophy of language is one of them, and that's the stuff we're going to be doing today and Thursday. Um, but the nature of truth itself, like what is truth, that's a metaphysical question. So the debate between pragmatists and what are so-called realists, um, that's, that's, not a <clears throat> that's not in the wheelhouse of critical thinking as much as it's just a topic of philosophical debate. Um, and I do, I, like I said earlier, I do want to be sort of flagging some of these bigger, broader philosophical questions and issues and themes, um, but even if they're not things we're going to be pursuing uh, really in-depth in this class, um, but there are those connection points. Our class, again, is really trying to focus more on the low-hanging fruit of what's sort of uncontroversial about reasoning, logic, and argumentation. Okay, so enough with that. Uh, we'll move on here, but if you want to talk more with me, I, I would love to do that. Okay, so why are we studying language? 
<clears throat> well, I already mentioned this idea like we can't evaluate something we don't understand. And uh, arguing happens as a communication activity. Language, uh, we could say, is the vehicle for arguments. And that's true even when we're not using natural languages like English or Japanese or Spanish uh, or any of, any of those other kinds of natural languages that are spoken and written. Um, but there are lots of uh, uh, linguistic systems that allow for communication, and arguments always happen in that. There, there's no way that we work with arguments without using the medium of language itself, even if it's symbolic or something like that. Like we'll do some symbolic logic later on this quarter. So anytime you're using, I, my favorite analogy for this is um, uh, uh, an artist, like a painter. Uh, if you're going to be a good painter, then there's kind of, I would say, maybe this is a little bit of my philosophy about art, but there's kind of two main arenas of skill that are, or factors that would contribute to whether you're a good artist. One of them is like artistic vision. Like, do you have anything worth expressing in art? Or what are you trying to say with your art or, or accomplish with it? Sort of the artistic ambitions of a work of art. That's one thing. But then there's your ability to execute on your vision. And that's like the craft of art, the, the skill. Um, the, a good artist needs to know how their paints and canvases and brushes work, like just how they physically respond, um, because that's the medium through which they'll be able to express an artistic vision. So you'll, you kind of need to have both things. The parts about like what vision you have, that stuff we'll be getting into later in the class. Um, and then some of that's just like the like wisdom of philosophy, period. But the, the craft of it, that's where studying language helps. As I say here in my lecture notes, understanding the vehicle allows us to separate out what's essential to arguments from what's incidental. So in other words, we make arguments uh, in America largely in English, sometimes with other languages too. English is not the only language spoken in America. But other places don't use English. Uh, but they're still able to do philosophy. It's not like you need to be speaking in English to do philosophy or to reason or make arguments. And there's some things about English that are different from other languages um, that make for differences in the way argumentation works. Not to even mention all the cultural stuff, too, which we'll be getting into in this lecture. Um, though that influences things. And if we're trying to evaluate the rational and logical merits of an argument, um, we don't want to get hung up or distracted on the way in which those things are expressed. I'm going to talk a lot throughout this quarter of this, I mean, it's almost going to be like a mantra about what we're really here to analyze are the ideas behind the words. And that's true even during this unit of philosophy of language and linguistic analysis that we're doing with chapter two. Um, we're still trying to get at the ideas that are behind uh, the vehicle that we use to express them. Um, and that's what listening is all about. So knowing a little bit about the mechanics of language and how it works is pretty useful. And that's why I've included it in, in this uh, curriculum. Um, I, have, I have some big picture ideas to share as sort of an introduction to linguistics too, but I'm, I'm going to start with this one before I go further in my lecture notes. Um, so there, I think there, it's useful to distinguish here between uh, ling linguistics and philosophy of language. So the, the stuff you're getting from the book, um, which is very influenced by a philosopher named Austin, who's a student of Wittgenstein. I'll be talking about Wittgenstein in this lecture. And then the really big one is Paul Grice, who is actually a contemporary living philosopher. I think he's still alive. Yeah, I think he is. Um, those philosophers are not really doing linguistics. They're doing philosophy of language. And what's the difference here? Linguistics is really focused around studying the contingencies of language use. So what makes languages different from each other? How do they have different mechanisms or devices or conventions? Um, philosophy of language is more focused on what is universal about language. Language as such, like what's going on across the board, like regardless of what language you're speaking in or whether it's a spoken language or the language of body language. Um, or uh, expression, facial expressions, or things like that. Nonverbal communication. 
um, what's just going on with language as a phenomenon. Um, and so the, the kind of stuff you're going to get here in the chapter two material, if it's correct, it's aiming at providing a kind of insight about communication that wouldn't be contingent just to English, but would apply to any system of communication whatsoever. Um, whether it, 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 because it's doing something that ambitious, if you're able to show that actually the things that are being treated as universal features of language are actually not universal, then that'd be a counterexample to the pro to theoretical proposal. Um, that's the, the sort of ambition that's going on here um, with these philosophers of language and what they're doing. But um, I, I wouldn't give this to you if I didn't think it was useful. <laughs> um, I, there are some, there's definitely some aspects of these theories that are controversial. The whole field of philosophy of language is highly controversial. Uh, I'll be indicating some of those things as we go along here. But at the end of the day, I, I might just say this to you. Um, even if you don't buy the Wittgensteinian theory or Paul Grice's theory or something like that as, as really accomplishing uh, this lofty ambition of making observations or presenting insights about language that are truly universal, even if you think it, fa it fails on that count, um, even if it's false, this theory is still very pragmatically useful. The kind of techniques that uh, follow from the theoretical basis here, uh, I think will improve your communication skills both as a listener and also as a speaker too. Uh, it gives you some more tools to apply to that uh, activity. Um, so I think, I think it's still worth studying even if it turns out to be objectively disproven or it's not, it's not the true answer about what's up with language. And it's at least a very good shot at it, and sometimes things can be wrong and still useful. So, um, okay. So the the other kind of big picture ideas I have here about language before we get into the details is first observing that linguistic meaning is always conventional, and by that I mean it's ultimately arbitrary. So we got this word pen in English to refer to these things. Um, it's a noise that I make with my mouth. I could also write it on uh, a surface here, right? But there's no reason, there's no essential or necessary reason why the noise pen or these shapes of markings have to be associated with the meaning that they have in English. That's just an arbitrary convention. Um, there's systems to those conventions, and we sometimes uh, try to make them as logical as possible. Uh, some languages are more intuitive and have less exception cases than others. English is a particularly bad one in this regard. Uh, it just has tons of exception cases on exception cases and lots of rules. And there's other languages that are definitely more elegant, um, That and they often happen because they have been designed specifically for that purpose. Um, I'm not an expert on it. My brother actually is. Uh, I'm not, but uh, I know just enough to be dangerous here. Korean is an example of a language that is supremely elegant because it was basically created by one person. Um, or uh, maybe I'm slightly wrong on that history, but I think it was a, a king that was like, I want to make a Korean language, and so he just made one. Uh, I think he had some help with it, but uh, you know, it was... Um, sort of constructed for a very particular purpose. Esperanto is another example of that too. Um, but a lot of other languages like English have this very messy evolutionary history to them where they're pulling things from other languages and smashing them together and all this kind of stuff. So you get something that's a, a little less planned uh, planned out. But they're all, even if they're more elegant, they're still conventional. I mean like in the case of Korean, is like the king is like, you're all speaking things this way now. Here are the rules. <laughs> you know, and that's, a, that's what happened. Um, so uh, that's always conventional and contingent. But we could say this is to be distinguished from thinking that the truth of the meanings that we express in a conventional language, they aren't conventional. I do put a little caveat here in my lecture notes where I say they're not always in parentheses conventional, because there are some truths that are conventional truths. For example, um, it, I love board games. Board games are my main hobby uh, outside of philosophy, which is my job and my hobby and my passion. Um, but I, when I play board games, like let's say I'm, I'm teaching someone a, a, a game, 
and then in the middle of the game we're playing it and they ask am I allowed to make this move and I would say maybe yes or maybe no and there's some truth to that when I say yes you are allowed to do that no you are not allowed to do that that's not just a matter of the conventions of language um, that statement is true but it's a conventional truth in the sense that what makes it true are just the rules that are in the rule book and you can always house rule stuff right you can take a game take the set of components it gives you and make some other game with it that's what I do with my two-year-old because <laughs> he can't understand all the rules of games but we just sort of play with them like toys um, and make up our own games to play with them so you can do that there's nothing there's no force of necessity here but within the space of playing a particular game like let's say we're playing chess um, there's rules that make chess the game that it is and if you break those rules well now you're just not playing chess anymore right you're just playing some other game so those are truths that are conventional or what is legal is a conventional truth because it's based on the conventions of our political system um, which are hopefully not entirely arbitrary but whether it turns out to be true or not just depends on what the government decides to do what the law is and that could be changed right so those are conventional truths but a lot of other the, of the, a lot of the claims that we make are not in that category there are some people out there who think all truths are conventional um, and that is more or less what you get with cultural relativism I mentioned relativism earlier um, but this is a pretty controversial view and it doesn't seem to square with a lot of our understanding of what rational justification looks like to tie it together with what we were talking about earlier this is again a, a philosophical tangent jumping off point that if you want to learn more about or talk more about I'd be happy to do so but I'm not going to go di diving deeper into that rabbit hole today um, but there's the is an upshot here of recognizing how uh, the meaning of words is conventional but truth is not usually conventional um, there is this phenomenon of playing with words and the potential for abusing the appeal to this phenomenon so this is what we mean when we're talking about like a linguistic dispute where two people in a debate are like talking past each other okay so um, sometimes uh, I think this happens, I see this happen on the internet a lot. Two people are having a disagreement and they're not using words in the same way or they have different senses of what those words mean. That causes them to misinterpret each other and then sometimes get a little worked up about it, right? They get the angry, maybe they start yelling at each other or it's the yelling equivalent in forum posts in text. But um, you get that kind of thing happening. And then someone might try to step in, and like that can be a real problem, right? Um, you got to kind of clarify your terms before you can be understood, before you can usefully evaluate things like we were already talking about. Um, but sometimes maybe you've seen this too. Two people are having a debate. They're, they're in a, a controversy. And someone tries to step in and play peacemaker and say things like, oh, you're just talking past each other. You're just using words in different ways. You don't really have a disagreement here. This is just a linguistic dispute, just chalking it up to that and under some circumstances sometimes that might be the case it might be that the only basis of disagreement is the fact that people are using words in different ways and as soon as those different senses are clarified they see oh we actually are we hold the same beliefs we have the same ideas we just express them in different ways but sometimes that's not just what's going on or or it's not happening at all and is misunderstood as that or that it is happening but there's also still an underlying principled rational disagreement that's taking place and the peacemaker might be sort of missing that missing the mark on that just because people disagree doesn't mean they're using words differently they might have a genuine disagreement as opposed to just a linguistic dispute um, and this is to be expected I'd say um, because when we've got different theoretical paradigms that we're operating with oftentimes those perspectives and worldviews generate specialized uses of language that fit with their outlook or perspective um, this is how there's like a, a little incestuous relationship between linguistic communities and cultural communities that they adapt to each other and shape each other language can have a cultural impact um, how we talk can matter for how we think and what our values are and what are sort of our social expectations on each other and vice versa but another example it's maybe a little more clinical for our purposes here um, that I really like using is psychology if 
any of you have studied psychology or psych, psych majors, um, you might be familiar with how there are just a bunch of different psychological schools of thought out there to the point where it can be kind of frustrating as a student um, because they all have their own languages. They all have their different technical terminology for um, different mental phenomenon. Um, and so you you might be looking at one school of psychology and another school of thought in psychology and being like, so this person's using these words, this person's using these words, are they the same thing or not? Or like, what's going on here? How do you get them to talk to each other uh, or much less debate each other? That can be really tricky at times. So <laughs> when I see people using language in different ways, I oftentimes think that's pretty close to a smoking gun that these people really do have a different perspective and there is some underlying genuine disagreement that's happening. Um, and that's not a bad thing. I, I think sometimes the, the, um, the, the peacemaker who's trying to step in and, and resolve conflict is maybe doing a disservice to people because some of those disagreements or conflicts are meaningful ones. And to, to say, oh, don't really disagree with it means we don't get to do all of the uh, things that criticism and, and exploring disagreement with our opponents uh, has to contribute to truth seeking and to learning more and growing more. So it's not like uh, it's a problem. I, I, I don't know if I said this to all of you, but I definitely said this to my one-on-one -on -one students in like presenting the field of philosophy. I like saying philosophers are troublemakers. They're, they go looking for trouble. They go, they're not interested in just going around collecting all the things that we agree on, but they're looking at the things that we don't agree on because um, that's where we have work to do. That's where there are rational considerations that need to be weighed against each other to figure out what really is the most rationally defensible position. So I think it's not bad to like not brush aside uh, or you know not rock the boat or something like that with places where we might end up clashing in our perspectives, but finding that um, is where we can have the chance to do some growth. Okay, so that's all the kind of preliminary stuff I really want to talk about. Um, our main subject for this week is how we use language. Um, and and how, what are sort of the mechanisms of this? And to, uh, well, maybe before I, I go in, I dive into this, let me check in with the chat. How are you doing, chat? Any, any questions that, for this whole first half of the lecture? Doing great? Cool? No questions? Okay. Trav, anything on your end? Not seeing anything from Trav? Okay. Uh, I'll move on. Um, We'll see, maybe something will pop up. Uh, this might actually be um, a good time to take a break. So uh, video's been going for 50 minutes, and those of you in the chat, you've been hearing me talk for about an hour. Um, so let's take a short break, and then I'll come back, and we'll, we'll dive into this main, main meat. Um, sound good to you? Okay. All right, I'll pause the video and uh, we'll be back in, say, like 10 minutes. All right, so getting into the real heart of the Chapter 2 material in this linguistic analysis. I think this is a good place to start, especially when we're doing this kind of philosophy of language thing as opposed to like the, the uh, empirical study of linguistics about these contingencies of one thing to another. You quickly get into territory it's pretty close, if not directly, in the field of cognitive science, which is actually one of my areas of specialization, although um, since I've started to become a teacher, uh, I haven't been able to engage with it quite as much. I don't get to build a whole lot of cognitive science into introductory philosophy classes. But it definitely shows up, and this is one of them. And in my um, studies in cognitive science, there is a kind of a, a theme or a... Um, a 
observation that came up, popped up over and over again, and it's kind of like a paradox. On the one hand, we generally take ourselves to be smarter than we actually are. That we, we kind of, in, in terms of critical thinking, we think of ourselves as being better critical reasoners than we in fact are. We exaggerate or inflate our own sense of our competency with regard to those skills. And at the same time, we generally seem to underestimate uh, our own intellectual abilities at, at, as well. So we, um, we don't maybe respect or understand how much we're able to actually process in terms of information and, and reasoning and stuff like that. And I think this unit will really give you that kind of experience. Um, I've had many students report that. That's sort of weird. It's like on the one hand, I'm like seeing how much is going on under the hood of my own brain, of my own mind. Um, and at the same time, noticing how much I like listen sloppily or reason sloppily in cases of communication. Um, and that there's places to shore up. So this is a big part of that theme I've mentioned before about making the implicit explicit. Uh, to help us do it better and to be able to communicate what is really happening up here uh, in a way that other people can participate with, which is very useful for things like communication activities. So you're going to see that. Um, one way in which we're really, really smart and smart and like smarter than we might think we are is that when we're communicating with each other, when you're listening to my lecture right now, um, you're processing information at breakneck speed. Your brain is like moving at light speed through hearing the like just the auditory sensations of my voice coming through your speakers um, and connecting it up with ideas in a way that is sometimes hard to detach to be able to separate those things. We can do it a little bit like you can play this game where you say a, a word over and over and then it starts to sound different. So I just said game and you probably thought of it, you had a concept of like flash in your mind, right? If I say like game, 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 game game, 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 game. Now you can start to just like hear it as just a sound rather than as like loaded with semantic content with conceptual meaning behind it. Um, but we move really quickly. And when we're talking, um, especially informally, a little less rigorously, well, even in all cases, I should say, um, you have this little like intuitive voice in your head which tells you what someone was saying. And that's the kind of product that comes out when you're like, you're hearing my, my, the noises I'm making with my mouth in real time and like tracking ideas, right? You're just there. Um, but there's a lot of work that's going behind what that little intuitive voice in your head is telling you. And what we're trying to do here in this analysis, and I know it's still mirrored for those of you on YouTube, I haven't forgotten about that, I'll be tracking that. Um, but we're looking at these different um, levels or layers that are feeding information in that informs what that little intuitive voice in your head is telling you people mean. And you don't, like I said before, you don't need to take this class in order to be able to communicate effectively or competently. Um, that's not required. But what we can definitely do is kind of like shore it up a little bit. Or you can have a deeper understanding of just what you're doing, like to be able to reflect on and understand what's happening. Um, oh, someone came in. I don't think that there's a class about to happen, but let me double check. I'll be right back. Okay, so um, yes, I, I do think um, uh, that this class will help us become more effective communicators. At least I, it's my hope. And I've, I've heard students definitely report that. So you can report back to me too. I'm always curious to hear what, how this material ended up uh, landing on you when, we're, when it's all said and done. Um, so. So there's a lot of things that are informing how we understand what people mean. And the mechanisms that contribute to that are importantly different from each other. And I want you to think about this not so much as like different utterances or uh, cases of linguistic communication fall into these buckets, so much as that all these different buckets, that these threads we're going to tease apart, are all um, layers that are happening Anytime anyone opens their mouth, anytime any communication is occurring whatsoever, you're getting meaning at all of these different levels of analysis. But we're trying to separate them out for one because the mechanisms are different, 
but also because there's kind of a linear process to this. So even though uh, YouTube people I know this is all backwards for you, maybe you can still tell here that this is linguistic act, speech act, and conversational act. And I can't understand the meaning that's happening at the conversational act level until I know what's happening at the speech act and the linguistic act level. And I can't really know what's going on at the speech act level until I know what's going on at the linguistic act level. So these things kind of build on each other. One source of meaning provides the context for understanding the next source of meaning. And this is a little bit controversial. The, I mean, this is really Austin's way of, of framing things up. Um, and, there, and even Austin's teacher, Wittgenstein, doesn't do it this way. And, and, and I'll talk about uh, some of the, a little, little surface level, tip of the iceberg um, kind of aspect of what's going on here. But that's our project. So in my diagram, we're going to have the three levels of meaning. And then down up, up here, I'm going to put in these boxes, what's the kind of meaning that we're getting at that level? And then down here in this box, I'm going to diagram what are the mechanisms that condition or generate that meaning that's up here, the up, up in here, in these boxes. So that's what we're going to do. We're just going to take it one at a time. We're starting with linguistic acts and, and understand how they work. Um, one other thing I like to say here as a little side note um, is that I've uh, taught this class many times to people who are... Um, uh, ESL students, so people for whom English is not your native language, uh, that you learned it. And I always have some students who are like a little concerned. They're like, I I'm already just kind of struggling to make sense of English, of like, will I be able to master, be competent with this kind of analysis of it? And one thing that's sort of come out in my experience working with students is that in some ways, having English not as your first language gives you a major advantage in mastering these skills. And part of that is due to the fact that if you had to learn, if, if English was not your native language, you had to learn it, then you are far more aware of the mechanisms that, uh, that, and the conventions that English is built out of, as opposed to a native speaker who's just like that intuitive voice in their head is just doing their thing. You know, you got that innate uh, functionality. Um, and you don't really know why you got it or like how it's working. Right? It's just the engine's running under the hood and drives the car and that's fine, right? Um, but if you're, if you're already used to English as a kind of artificial structure that's not intuitive, then it's a little easier to, to figure out what's happening at these different levels of analysis. You're already used to having a relationship with English in this kind of way. If you're a native English speaker, this is probably going to be harder. And one of the things uh, I can describe about how this analysis is going to feel especially for native speakers here, is that that intuitive voice in your head is just saying, this is what Tim said, right, or whoever you're talking to. Um, but what we're going to try to do is, like, slow it down, like looking at the, like, the, the cognitive processes in slow motion to see how we get from the, ulti the early level here of, like, the sensation that was experienced, like the sound of my voice, all the way over to here's what that intuitive voice is saying I meant. So looking at all the steps, the logical steps, uh, for how that meaning gets constructed. So it's kind of going in slow motion, like kind of dumbing it down. Um, I'll talk about that, especially with the linguistic act level of meaning here. Um, to take it one step at a time. That's what we're going for. So, so let's get into it. Um, is there a class about to happen here? Uh, what time? 1.30? Or, I'm sorry, 2, two o'clock? Okay. All right, I'm going to have to switch rooms, everyone. Um, so let, I'm going to pause the video, and then we'll find, I'll get this set up in a second. Okay. I'm back here. We've got a little chart. And here we go. Oh, um, are you in communication? Oh, sorry, I'm going to pause this here, a little technical thing. All right, so getting back into it here. Um, when it comes to this first level, the linguistic act level of meaning, um, we're working with the really, really basic uh, 
conventions of language. And I'm going to refer to the meaning that we get at this level in terms of the literal meaning. So here's where I might um, pull up the screen here for those of you on YouTube. So we can do it like this so you can, you can see what's happening here, not mirrored uh, with that video issue. Okay, so I'm, am I out of frame? <laughs> okay. So I'm going to draw over here. Let's turn. I can't. Yeah. So I, I'm going to. This is again the meaning that we're getting at this level of analysis, and we're going to get what I'm going to call the literal meaning. But I'm I'm going to put this in scare quotes. Literal is in scare quotes here, because. This is not what that little intuitive voice in your head is telling you. That, that's not what we're getting here. Um, we're getting we're, we're getting just um, the, the meaning that's generated at this level comes from the basic semantic and syntactic conventions of the language. So is that visible here? Yeah, you can see that. Um, the semantic and syntactic conventions for the language. So the book defines a linguistic act as what's happening anytime someone expresses a meaning in a language. And by a language, we just mean a set of semantic and syntactic conventions. That's it. So um, the, the kind of basic rule of thumb here for how to um, think about this is that Think of semantics as dictionary definitions. And syntax is like grammar. So if you're taking a, 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 a language that's foreign to you, that's not your native uh, speaking language, you know, early on, the first year or class that you take learning that language, you're going to learn basic vocabulary, which is what the semantic conventions are. And you're going to learn basic rules of grammar, of how you arrange those words into sentences that generate complete thoughts. Now, there still are semantic and syntactic conventions even for nonverbal languages, like um, body language and tone of voice and gestures and even things like dance um, and music and all that kind of stuff. Um, semantic conventions are taking a object of linguistic representation and connecting it with what is the idea that it represents. So this is a this is a representational type of phenomenon and there is a lot of philosophy that's based on trying to understand what representational relationships really are and I'm, I'm not going to go into the super big depths of this. Um, but to use uh, a, um, a particular philosopher here who's sort of uh, at least Wittgenstein treats him as an example or an exemplar of the traditional way of thinking about language. Um, we've got St. Augustine. And St. Augustine presents this model where it's like, I have an idea in my head, and I need to get familiar with these sets of conventions to be able to encode my thought to figure out which devices represent the ideas I'm trying to communicate, express them, someone else receives those things and then knows how to decode them, how to like associate relationships between a symbol and what that symbol is supposed to represent, the sign signified relationship. That's a representational relationship and the thing that mediates it is a semantic convention. So that's why I was saying like pen doesn't have to refer to these things, but it does in English. Um, we make those connections. So think about it like encoding and decoding that that's what's going on on this level, and this is a this is probably a, a pretty natural basic way of thinking about language. It, it, in in all respects, I I teach some Wittgenstein in my one on one class, and when I ask my students like, okay, what's language and how it works, they usually give me a model like that. You got a thought in your head, you need to encode it, and then someone else hears it and decodes it, and if their thought is sufficiently similar to the thought that you had in expressing yourself, then successful communication has occurred. And if those thoughts are different, or the decoding has not been able to happen, then miscommunication, a failure to communicate, has occurred. 
Um, and that's it. But there's a lot more to the story that we're going to get here just beyond this stuff. Um, but this is where it all kind of begins, according to Austin. Um, this, is, this sets the initial framing of things. So um, by doing this encoding and decoding, uh, recognizing these basic conventions, if you know the conventions, if you know the semantic and syntactic conventions of the language, then when you encounter a linguistic object, like a noise being made from someone's mouth, uh, observing visually some inscriptions on a surface, uh, observing someone's body language, like this, or or maybe even this, you get an idea. A picture is painted in your mind, and that picture is the literal meaning. So I'm going to talk about this as uh, you know, the picture painted by the words. While languages are as diverse as the representational systems that we can design for them, um, like where even something like dance can count as a language, um, I had grad school in Michigan, and so I'd go down to Chicago, and I saw there, Chicago is big on experimental dance, uh, and there's definitely like they're just dancing, but there's a story, like they're communicating something with their uh, dancing. We're we're going to mostly stick to natural languages here, and to English in particular here. Um, the, I'm not going to be giving you uh, exam problems in other languages or video clips of dancing and you have to analyze that. We're going to be looking at uh, expressions in English and working on that. So the words, the English words that you, you encounter, the picture that's painted by them, that's the meaning we get at the linguistic act level. Um, but in terms of really getting a strong grasp of what's happening at this level, it's not so much about what it is doing as much as what it isn't doing. Um, that's the really key idea here. So um, here I'm going to bring this up, um, bigger picture here. So it's what's really tricky about answering this question, what's the literal meaning, which by the way, as we saw from the beginning of the lecture, when I have the exam problems, that question is question number one on the exam. When you're doing your analysis, you have to start there. What's the literal meaning? The really tricky thing about it is making sure that you don't let any of the rest of stuff creep in, that you're just restricting your, your interpretation to the basic semantics and syntactics of English, and that's it. Uh, no, only, well, only the kind of meaning you get from a dictionary and a grammar text, nothing more. Don't to project anything more in it. And it is tough. I've worked with students. I've taught this class dozens of times. And this is, this is kind of one of the first obstacles of not trusting that intuitive voice in your head. You have to really restrict. You, kind of, you have to dumb yourself down <laughs> to not be as clever and not, uh, not have that kind of mental alacrity that just jumps straight to all the other meanings that happen, which you will do. This is part of the putting things in slow motion thing. In particular... If you think that you're doing anything clever at all in your interpretation, like making an informed judgment call of any kind, you are not in just the level of the linguistic act anymore. You're in other phases. And in particular, probably the phase of the conversational act. Uh, there's kind of a, a dividing line here where everything, on, everything that's a matter of implication, like subtle meanings, hidden meanings, under the table kind of stuff. That's all happening here. No implication shows up over here. This is all what is uh, the linguistic act and speech act level is everything that is explicit um, and public. That as long as you understand the conventions, you're able to decode the meaning, nothing more is required. Um, so any, if you're bringing anything else into the table, uh, bringing anything else to the table when you're doing your interpretation of the meaning, you're, you haven't restricted yourself just to the linguistic act level. And for this reason, I know it's still mirrored on the screen, sorry people, but um, I'm going to talk about what I'm writing here. Um, your answer to this question, actually, you know, I'm going to fix this so you can all read it on YouTube. Your answer to what is the literal meaning here I encourage you to 
use what I like to call robot speak. You basically have to re-articulate the passage that you're analyzing um, in a way that only draws attention to the meaning you get here and none of the rest of the meaning. And your answer here will actually take the form of a kind of utterance. So when you're thinking about, uh, can you see that on the screen? The screen keeps waggling around. Okay, there we go. Yeah. So, yeah. Your answer to the first question here of analysis, what's the literal meaning, will take the form of like an utterance that's maybe done in this robot speak thing. And let me give you an example of what I have in mind. Um, so there's a... There's a bunch of really good examples from the book that I'm actually fond of, but I'll, I'll start here with one that isn't from the book so I don't spoil any homework problems, but we might spoil a couple homework problems. Um, so take this example. Um, oh, no, no, no. I'm, I, I've got a better one for illustrating this particular point, and it is from the book, so I'm going to steal it. Okay, so uh, maybe some of you have looked at, at the book a little ahead of time. There's one that says, um, the governor has the brains of a three-year-old. So if we're going to figure out what is the literal meaning of that utterance, what's the meaning that we only get at the linguistic act level? That's only a matter of dictionary definitions and, and knowledge of grammar rules. That's it. Um, what would it look like? And an answer that I, I would give or propose to you here as like an ideal answer would be something like um, the regional governor, the, the government representative from the region has gray matter in their skull approximately the same as that of a three-year-old human child. Something like this. Right? Um, find, like, break out the thesaurus, find uh, synonyms for words, and the more awkward way that you can word it, the better. Because when things are expressed in really awkward ways, they don't generate implication very easily. Um, we really do, do just have to take them at face value. Um, but that's your job here in answering this first question is pulling apart like I just decode those words and what's the picture that's painted and that's it. Now the governor has the brains of a three-year-old doesn't mean what I just said but that's because of implication. That's because of what's going to happen at later stages here and to understand and track what's going to happen later according to Austin we do have to start with this stuff the literal meaning. Chat I'm very interested in checking in with you how are things going? Have any questions popped up as I've been talking? No questions? Okay. Okay. Okay, let's talk about some edge cases here. So, um, oh, Neil, no questions, okay. Um, so let's talk about some edge cases here. Uh, so the linguistic act is, is defined as expressing a meaning in a language. So as long as you have a language, a set of semantic and syntactic conventions, and someone's utilizing them, boom, you've got a linguistic act, and you have a meaning that's happening of like what a literal meaning is. Uh, based on those conventions. Now, uh, a language like English is not monolithic. You've got dialects. Um, people use words in different ways. Uh, certainly when I teach philosophy to my students, like my 101 class, it's like learning a foreign lang language sometimes, even though it's expressed in, for many of my students, their natural language, English. Um, because words are used in different ways and they have different associated meanings. Um, sometimes philosophers choose ordinary words uh, and treat them as technical words, uh, technical terms of art. Um, that they're not just based on their ordinary usage, but they're used in, in much more technical ways. So um, anytime you've got, uh, e there can be deviations from this, right? And different linguistic communities uh, will have different meanings. And miscommunication can happen there because people are decoding what was literally said and done in a different sort of way. Um, or I'm sorry, I skipped ahead here about the done stuff. What was literally said, the picture painted by the words will come out different because you've got different semantic, especially semantic conventions that the speaker and the hearer are operating under. 
Um, so that can generate miscommunication. And that wouldn't be something to chalk up. Uh, we're we're going to have to talk about the role of culture in all of this. But culture is going to show up in different ways. And context is going to matter for all these levels, but in different ways. I think sometimes we have a tendency to treat context and culture as both like, like they're their own source of a force that contributes meaning. But really they're not. I mean, they, they have a role to play in all this, but that role is going to show up differently based on the mechanisms of these different sources of meaning that are contributing to the overall picture. So one way in which those kinds of contingencies can affect what happens here is through just different dialects, different linguistic communities that have different sets of conventions. Um, so that, that's, that's about all I've got to say here. Oh, oh, there's one other thing. Sometimes, uh, and this will make a little bit more sense when we get through the whole story, but um, there's going to be cases where uh, something doesn't start out as having a meaning that happens at the linguistic act level, that it's originally something more like an implication, an implied meaning, but then because of usage, it becomes codified. And there's a lot of things like that in English. Idiomatic expressions, uh, or turns of phrase. Um, many people use them and use them competently, but they don't remember like where they came from. Like even the word OK, I, I watched a documentary about the word OK and its historical origins, which is a hilarious story. Um, and very uh, idiosyncratic. It's almost like an inside joke. But at this point, no one knows about that past history. You don't, when you hear the word OK, you're not running through this whole process of how implication is generated in your head. You're just like, OK means good, fine, acceptable, something like that. That's it. So sometimes things that originally seem idiosyncratic or culturally influenced or something like that do become codified, and then their meaning becomes one that no cleverness is required. It's just a straightforward, here's this word, here's its meaning, sign what's symbolized by it, what's represented by it. That's it. OK, so that's linguistic act level of meaning. Let's, uh, let's, let's uh, see how far we can get. We're actually moving along pretty good in the lecture. So I might be able to get a little more ambitious with my uh, lecture um, on Thursday. In fact, I may even skip ahead to some chapter three stuff. We'll see. Uh, I, w I definitely want to keep this train moving this quarter as fast as possible, because we're so under the gun with summer. And like I mentioned, this is my first time doing it online during summer. I've done on, uh, on campus during summer for this class, but online's a little different. So um, we'll be working out uh, a pacing. But anything we can do to set ourselves up with more time later will be good. But I think to try to finish off this video, let's try to knock out what's going on with the speech act level. So um, chat, again, you're my, my kind of guinea pigs, my canaries in the coal mine. Anything about this chart that's confusing so far? Anything I could clarify about it? before I start doing more stuff with it. So again, we got the meaning that is generated at this level of analysis, and then the mechanism down here that generates it. That's feeling good? OK, OK. All right, so let's go here. So now we're getting into speech acts. So again, think about, um, th this is going to be important for the distinction I'm about to make. Um, think about the linguistic act level of meaning as really like a picture. You know, there's a, a thought in someone's head, and then, oops, sorry. Uh, there's a thought in someone's head, and then we're trying to like transfer that thought to another person's head. And successful communication is about whether this happens within tolerance limits or not. Speech act level of analysis is going to get us into really different territory. The kind of meaning we're going to get here is about what is, again in scare quotes, literally done. This is something very different, a done. This is an action, a speech act. I mean, all of these are worded as actions, linguistic act, speech act, conversational act. The reason why this language is used, well, actually, Austin uses Locutionary, uh, perlocutionary, and illocutionary acts, or maybe I'm mixing those up a little bit. Those terms are obnoxious, so we're not going to use them because they all sound the same. So we're going to go with linguistic act, speech act, conversational act. But Austin is getting this from um, their student or their teacher, Wittgenstein. 
And Wittgenstein is what's really relevant for this speech act level of analysis. Um, yeah, actually, before I do more at the chart, let, let me just kind of talk at you here for a little bit. So Wittgenstein is a, kind of a big deal uh, in the history of philosophy, especially in the philosophy of, of, of language. Um, uh, he, like I said, he uses Augustine as a representative of the standard model, which is really represented here in Austin's model through the Linguistic Act. But Wittgenstein was more radical than what Austin is going to be presenting here. Wittgenstein thinks that all linguistic meaning is really a matter of actions, of how words are used, rather than what they represent. So the kind of model that you're getting here from the Linguistic Act of signs signified, Wittgenstein's like, nope, that's not what language really is. That's not the essence of it. That's not what it is deep down. That for, for Wittgenstein, language gets its meaning from how it's a part of other human activities. So um, let me give you an illustration that I think Wittgenstein would be, um, would, would tickle him. So um, I can't do this in the room because the camera doesn't get over there, but um, this is somewhat based on real events. Um, let's say I'm finishing up class, and there's students in the classroom here. Not, it's not an online class. Um, I'm finishing up a lecture. Class is over, and I've sort of ended up over by the door. And I'm talking with a student. And another student comes up and is like, will you please move? Will you please get out of the way? And I'm like, cool. Message received. And I go back talking to this other student. Blah, 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 blah. And they're like, Tim, can you please move? I'm like, gotcha keep talking. They're like, Tim, did you hear what I'm saying? Do you understand me? And I'm like, I understand you perfectly. Your words painted a picture in my head that said, you want me to move out of the way because uh, you're trying to leave. I, I'm, I'm starting to extrapolate a little bit here, but you're trying to, you want to get me out of the place where the door is for you to have access to the door. I'm like, I got it. Successful communication. And I go back talking. I mean, that other student's going to be like, this is not successful. This isn't, this isn't working. Like, the, and their first thought will be, Tim doesn't understand. Right? He doesn't understand what I'm saying because his behavior is not responsive to what's going on here. Okay? So maybe you're getting a little picture of where Wittgenstein's going here. Wittgenstein is like, the meaning of, of that student asking me to get out of the way is really that it is a request. And it's not the purpose of it its function is not to just make an idea appear in my head, but to get a certain behavior to, a, to happen. That them expressing that meaning, or, or expressing themselves the way that they did, I gotta be careful about what words I'm using here to describe it. The way that they expressed themselves was a move in a game. And that required, there's rules to these games, and my response is not adequate. Um, it doesn't, it's not in line with what we're up to here uh, using the language. Wittgenstein's big observation, and I'd say his contribution to our understanding of linguistics, uh, is that he recognizes that w language is bigger than just this. That we use language for things. And a lot of the meaning of language is the purposes to what we, that we put to it. So you maybe have heard from like an English class about um, the, and it's, in, it's actually in the text for our reading here too, the uh, indicative imperative, interrogative, and expressive mood. These are four basic functions of what we do with language. We make claims, we indicate things, make statements, we uh, give commands, we ask questions, and we express our emotions. Language performs those functions. And there's a whole heck of a lot of other things that we're doing with language too, including especially, for our purposes in this class, arguing. Language is a way in which we do that activity. So language uh, fits in with these other activities that we're doing, and Wittgenstein calls those language games. They're also subject to rules and conventions, but they're conventions for behavior instead of conventions of sign-signified relationships. So it's not like he thinks this sort of Augustinian model of meaning is like totally off base, but he doesn't think that it's the deepest understanding of what actually makes language happen. At one point in the philosophical investigations, he says, Wittgenstein says, um, is the purpose of a word to elicit an image in your head 
like striking a note on the keyboard of the imagination. And he says, that's, that's this kind of model, right? I say these words and you decode them and you get a thought in your head. He says, well, it may be the purpose, but it's not the only purpose. And he actually makes a reference to board games, which tickles me. He says, it's like saying that defining a board game as um, the activity of moving objects around on a surface according to rules. And the response is, uh, or that's a way of defining games. And Wittgenstein says, but our response would be, well, you seem to be defining board games, but those aren't all the games there are. So the, the purpose of like hearing words or reading words and getting an idea in your head, that's sometimes maybe the purpose of language, like if you're at a poetry reading or something like that, but it's not the purpose of language in a lot of other situations. That, that's not a, a completely adequate analysis of linguistic meaning writ large. So Wittgenstein makes for a, a re really extreme uh, reframing of how we understand the phenomenon of language itself. Austin, Wittgenstein's student, doesn't go full Wittgenstein, but um, definitely takes some insights away. I mean, really, I, I look at Austin's theory as an attempt to sort of integrate both the Augustinian or traditional way of approaching understanding philosophy of language with Wittgenstein. And it, the big thing that Wittgenstein would disagree about from Austin is that for Austin, everything starts with the linguistic act understanding. And then we're in a position to understand the speech act. So let me go, let, let's go back to the chart here now and we can fill it out a little bit more. So uh, what we, the meaning we get at the speech act level is what's literally done. And that is conditioned or constructed based on conventions for behavior, which are the rules of, we'll use the Wittgensteinian term here, language games. So, if I'm asking you this question on the exam, which I will, that asks, number two, what is the speech act? I'm getting a frame here. What is the speech act here? Your answer will take the form of a verb. Let's see where's the best place for me to sit here. Yeah, there we go. Okay, so <clears throat> I want to make sure you can see over my shoulder here what's going on on the board. So um, asking the question, what's the speech act, is asking for what has been literally done. What has been done publicly and transparently based on passing this message along. So you've got a meaning, like a picture painted with the words, according to Austin, right? That's the meaning we get over here at Linguistic Act. By me painting that picture with my words, what have I thereby done? And that'll be a verb that describes my action, what I have accomplished, or what move in the game did I make by painting that picture with my words. And that'll be set by these conventions for behavior. And I got a whole heck of a lot of examples to talk to you about with regard to explaining this. And again, culture's gonna show up here in a pretty major way. Um, and actually, let's start with that. So you might be um, familiar, uh, I don't know how many of you um, have not only learned a foreign language, but maybe lived in um, the country or the community in which that language is spoken naturally. Um, and one thing, uh, like I, I did this with, I took five years of Japanese, and I was on a, like a Japanese exchange program. My, my high school had a sister school in Tokyo, and we did an exchange program, so I was there for about five weeks, something like that, four or five weeks. And I had some Japanese under my belt. You know, I had these semantic and syntactic conventions, um, but there's a lot more to communication than just that, and that's what Wittgenstein's pointing out to us. So um, I could put this in maybe more informal senses, like just because you know how to ask, like, where's the bathroom, doesn't mean you're going to necessarily have successful communication interactions with people who speak that language, because what you might be not on the same page about, even if you're on the same page with the semantic and syntactic conventions, you might not be on the same page about conventions for behavior. 
And a really good illustration and example of this is how different cultures treat different behaviors or actions as gestures of respect, let's say. And this is a good example because something like respect doesn't require getting into very much conversational implication. If you live in a linguistic community, um, if you live in a culture, there's pretty clear conventions for behavior and expectations around that. Like, um, I mean, even, I, this is a very tired example, but uh, the like shaking hands versus bowing in, in Japan. Like, those are two different ways to express respect. Or um, one thing that I ran across was how uh, in my host family, um, a way of expressing respect and uh, kind of friendliness is by insulting your own family members. <laughs> like basically downplaying, how, not talking about how good they are, but basically all their flaws. Um, or uh, another kind of um, more silly example here, uh, I'm speaking about Japanese culture just because I'm a little more familiar with it. Um, like uh, slurping soup in a restaurant, be rude here, but that's a sign of respect to the chef. They're like, this is really good. Like you're letting them know, right? So little things like that of like what kinds of um, actions or behaviors are encoded as gestures of respect. That's a matter of conventions of behavior, not a matter of the semantic and syntactic conventions. And that's why any foreign language class worth its salt is not just teaching you vocab and grammar, but it's teaching you about culture too so that you can effectively communicate with people who speak that language naturally and the kind of context in which that usually occurs. And things get really complicated here, of course, because cultures are not monolithic either and they are different you know, subcultures that exist in say a country or in a community um, and that can affect things. Um, another example I like to use here would be like a classic rom-com scene, like uh, two people know each other, um, and one person is like inviting the other person to have dinner with them. And the person who maybe was invited thinks that they're just hanging out with a friend, like with a buddy. And the other person thinks that they're going out on a date. And then throughout the conversation, you know, there's misunderstanding because they have a different sense of what the purpose of the conversation is. That purpose is actually going to get more into the conversational act. But just in terms of, let, I'll come back to that scenario later when we do that. But for the purposes of the speech act, um, what kind of linguistic behavior would constitute asking someone out on a date? In that scenario, the speaker thinks, I have done the thing, you know, I've, I've painted a picture with my words that accomplishes asking someone out on a date, and then they said yes, right? Whereas the other person might have different understandings of the conventions for behavior, the like conditions that have to be met for that behavior to have occurred, um, and so they didn't pick up on that this was them, the other person asking them on a date, that it wasn't that kind of thing. So those are some examples. Um, other examples I really like. Um, there's so many behaviors, and specifically games even, this goes really far with the game thing, that involve language. Uh, baseball is one of my favorite examples here because there's a lot of language happening in baseball. Um, so maybe some of you don't know as much about baseball, but... Um, Maybe maybe you know enough to make this example work. I got those other examples too, but the book talks about uh, an umpire calling a batter out, yeah, like do the little punching thing too. Um, uh, there are a ton of rules for not only what does it take in order to the umpire to perform the action of calling the batter out, but also about the. Um, the rules about how that affects the game. And that's what, the kind of stuff that Wittgenstein's getting into. Like, they aren't just painting a picture with the words, but by doing that, things have changed. When the umpire yells, you're out, the state of the game is different. Now the batter has to go sit down. That's one more out, and if there are three outs, the inning is over, and then the team switch sides. Um, there's, uh, you're going to reset the, the pitch clock of uh, balls and strikes, the pitch count of, of balls and strikes. Um, other, uh, other players can't advance on the bases. Like There's all these other rules that are involved with the umpire making that action, performing that speech act okay, of calling the batter out. And notice how calling the batter out is worded as a verb, right? It's describing an action. 
And that's what your answer needs to look like. So saying you're out, um, the speech act is not the verb of the sentence, but it's the verb that describes what the speaker has done by painting the picture that they painted with their words at the linguistic act level. That's why this comes first for Austin and this comes second. I need to know what's the picture that's been painted before I can ask myself the question, what did the speaker do or what did they perform by passing that message along, by painting that picture with their words? Uh, going into like all the conditions and rules that are involved with speech acts uh, and noticing how just many there are, I really like this example of how uh, the umpire yells, you're out. So can a fan in the stands. Like when I'm at a baseball game, I yell, you're out at certain things, especially if, I'm, if the umpire could hear me. I might say that more. Um, but there's a big difference. I mean, in terms of the linguistic act level, for me to say you're out and for the umpire to say you're out, exactly the same meaning. Decode the words, take out your dictionary, it's going to have the same meaning. But when the umpire says it, it's a different act. It's a different speech act than when I say it. When the umpire says it, the batter is now out. When I'm the fan in the stands and I'm saying, you're out, I have not called the batter out. What I've done is maybe express my opinion, made a statement, something like that, but I have not called the batter out. Only the umpire can do that. Kind of similarly to another example from the book that I like, um, marrying people. Like when some official you know, conducting a wedding ceremony now says, I now proclaim you whatever and whatever, right? Um, that By saying that, then they are therefore married, right? And maybe, and maybe you say, oh, okay, you know, they need to sign the paperwork for City Hall and that kind of thing. But, um, you know, that's an action. That's a, it's at least a social action of a ceremony that now, now something's occurred. Like the state, is the state of play is different now. These two people are now married to each other before they weren't. But I can't go around on the streets saying, like, I now proclaim you whatever and whatever, and now those people are married. That's not going to have, like, two random strangers that I say this to. It, it's not performing the same action. In that case, um, in order for those words to have that meaning of performing that action, um, the people that are being spoken to need to be involved in that process a little bit. They need to intend to be married or assent to it or con consent to it, right? They need to be agreeing to that for it to be able to have that power. So that's what we're getting at at the speech act level. Chat, how are we doing? Good? This is all making sense? Cool, cool, cool. Nice, nice. Okay, so it sounds like chat's doing great. You watching this on YouTube later, maybe you've got some questions. I definitely want to um, emphasize or, or encourage uh, just a little bit of fear here in the sense of like recognizing how different these two levels are from each other. And again, let me uh, make the video non-weird. Non so here, I'm going to step over here. Oh, okay, there we go. So I have to be careful here about how I'm looking. Oh, what happened there? Something just changed on the video. Uh, okay, whatever. Um, hopefully that's that's got to be way too small to be legible now. Okay. Oh, it's because I moved it backward. Man, this smart camera is not so smart. Eh. Okay. Let's try that. See if it stays. All right. So, so much of the difficulty of doing this analysis is pulling apart these different levels of meaning and separating them clearly from each other. So if there's, if there's anything that is uncertain um, about what makes this meaning different from this meaning, I, I want to help you with clarifying that. So don't be shy. A bunch of people have been calling me up recently this week, and I love that. Um, please keep doing it. Uh, feel free to, to you know, knock on my electronic door, door of my phone, uh, whenever you want. But this is where I think the chart is really helpful and especially down here. Knowing the mechanisms that generate these meanings really help you to see how they're doing something very, very different. Um, the conventions for behavior, these rules of language games, are not defined by the semantic and syntactic conventions. They don't, these just make these associated connections of representational meaning. They don't tell you what it, 
what to do with it. <laughs> this, is, this is in the context of culture because it's about expectations for behavior. Um, but again, like I drew the squiggle line over here, both of these are public transparent meanings. They're just one-to-one -one decoding of what a person did, like their, the utterances that they made, in accordance with these framing devices of these conventions down here. So um, culture, we sometimes talk about them as unspoken rules, but they're understood by the people who participate in those communities. Um, and people take for, for granted that that's what's happening. So it's not always like these rules are explicit, that you studied them, uh, or you could define them. There are certain speech acts that might be pretty hard to define, like how do you define this, what counts as the speech act, what are the necessary and sufficient conditions for asking someone out on a date? I mean, that's, that might be hard to pin down with a lot of precision. Um, but there, those rules are definitely there, and we have an intuitive understanding of them. It doesn't require any cleverness. If you're operating with certain understandings of these rules, you will get a meaning here. You will understand this meaning. If you have different sets of conventions in mind, you'll get a different meaning. And this is where miscommunication can also definitely occur because people are operating with different assumptions about what these conventions for behavior are. Clever interpretation of like, oh, I think this person's really trying to mean this. That's all the stuff that's going to be happening over here with the conversational act. And I'm going to save that for the next lecture because that's a big, big can of worms. This is, this is the thing that's going to take the most time. There's the most to talk about. Um, these first two are a little more straightforward, but they're still a little tricky. And understanding this relationship will actually be very helpful for understanding what's going to happen over there with the conversational act. Um, let me see if there are more things I can say here. Oh, 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 yeah. Here, here's, uh, here's a big, big piece of advice, uh, or a kind of instruction, I should say. Um, when in doubt, when you're like looking at maybe a homework problem or a problem on the exam where I'm asking you, you know, question two, what's the speech act? Um, and you're like, I don't know what's going on here. Or it's like feels weird. You're not sure what to say. You do have a fallback here. Um, pretty much every linguistic expression, every linguistic act is going to be in one of these four categories of indicating, stating, making claims, stuff like that asking questions, giving commands, or expressing emotions. Those are kind of the four basic ones that you can always be thinking about in giving your answer of like, what's the verb here that describes what the person literally did by speaking? By passing along this message, what have they thereby done? That, that's what you'd want to get into. So you can always start with those four. Um, but there's many times we're doing multiple things at the same time. Another thing that comes out when you study linguistics and philosophy of language is you realize humans are multitaskers. We're trying to pack a lot of information in as an efficient space as possible. So there can be multiple things going on at the same time. So you might try giving like a basic answer, um, but then you also might look for these more, what I'll call esoteric speech acts, like the umpire calling the batter out, a priest marrying people, complimenting someone, insulting someone, um, asking someone out on a date. Like those are more specific contextually specific speech acts. They're not being performed all the time, but only sometimes. Um, think about those two. I, I want you to think about both. And you can, you can give multiple answers. You don't have to pick just one verb to describe what happened. Um, and here's another big piece of advice, friendly warning. Um, I never want to see on the exam speech act answers that say things like, they said something, or they were replying, or they are implying something. And it, they're implying this mu message or communicating this message. Those answers are all bad answers for the reason that they're trivial. If anyone opens their mouth, they're saying something. If anyone opens their mouth after someone said something, they're replying. We want to get a little more specific here about what, what particu particular move in a game someone has made as opposed to the other things that they could have been doing instead. So um, those answers are always going to be zero credit answers in my book. Um, don't say things like that. Uh, it's also very tempting to kind of have the speech act be a repeat of the literal meaning, and it'll never be that. Um, and again, as a warning I said earlier, just as a, a, while I'm going through a bunch of tips here, a piece of advice, 
Um, in very rare cases, or sometimes rare cases, the speech act is the actual verb of the uh, of the utterance. Um, these are called explicit performatives by the book. Um, by the way, I'm not that interested in talking about explicit versus non-explicit performatives, so I'm, there's not going to be anything on the exam about that. Um, but uh, but while it does sometimes happen that um, the verb of the sentence we say is actually the verb that describes the speech act, in many cases it's not. So asking what the speech act is not just a straightforward thing of saying here's the verb of the sentence. Uh, for example, um, when the umpire calls the batter out, you're out, they uh, have not, uh, like calling the batter out was not a part of the sentence itself. Um, or if I uh, say to someone, um, well, like I w someone said, said to me, nice hat. They've complimented me, but they didn't say something, I want to compliment you on your nice hat. That would be an explicit performative, right? Or if I say, um, I apologize, I have apologized, right? So that verb of the sentence ends up being the verb that describes the speech act. But in other cases, it doesn't. So just be on guard against that. So those are, those are my big tips here on uh, answering this question, what is the speech act of the sentence? In summary, if you're wondering how to approach this in practice, like doing the homework problems, when you're asking yourself, what is the speech act of the utterance that you're analyzing, ask yourself the question, what has the speaker done by painting this picture with their words that you got at the linguistic act level of meaning? So first you ask yourself, what's the literal meaning? Then you ask yourself, what's the speech act? What are they doing by passing along that message? That's what you're trying to figure out. Um, what move in a game have they made? When they opened their mouth and said what they said, how does that change the situation? How would you describe that change, that move? That's what we're getting at. Uh, to close off this lecture, first I need to give you a code word. I need to not forget about that. And then I'm going to draw this into the broader context of the class this quarter. I'm looking around myself for some kind of code word. Well, I got complimented on my hat, so um, I don't want to do too many Star Trek references for codes this quarter, but let's do one. Um, let's do uh, Starfleet. Starfleet, that's the, this logo, Starfleet. Starfleet is the code word, phrase, whatever, for this video, so you can put that in the quiz. Um, so I'm going to leave with this. So going back to my lecture notes here. Um, I say here uh, that there, we, re we really are interested in tracking speech acts when we're thinking about analyzing arguments and participating in debates and all that kind of stuff that we're doing in critical thinking. Because like I said earlier, one of the basic things we do with language is argue, debate. I mean, arguing itself is a speech act. Uh, that I was defining it as arguing is the act of forming an argument, right? Of supporting a claim with at least one other claim. Doing that act of supporting claims, that's arguing. But there's a whole lot of other speech acts that are involved in arguing. that are kind of like sub-activities of that broader activity or project. Concluding, basing, stipulating, assuring, conceding, admitting, supporting, denying, granting, replying, in the sense of argumentative replying, like replying to an objection. Um, and tons more. And in the next unit, in the Chapter 3 unit, we're going to talk about some really noteworthy performatives or speech acts that are a part of arguing. I'm going to call them maneuvers. They're like things people do as a part of the game of debate. Um, they're moves in that game. So we'll, we'll be bringing this back. This stuff is not just going to be for this unit, but it'll set up some stuff we'll be talking about in the future. Um, so... A big part, I actually, yeah, let me say just a couple words more here before I draw this video to a close. Um, when I work with my students when they're in my other classes where they have to write original philosophy papers um, and how to be a good writer, uh, good for writing a, uh, the kind of unique sort of paper that a philosophy paper is, I tell the students that it really helps, especially when you're in a complicated debate, to explicitly communicate what you're doing when you're dropping cards on the table. So like while you're making claims, 
maybe as a part of arguing for something. Making it clear like why you're bringing something up, what role you think it plays as a part of the activity of arguing. Like are you presenting an objection right now? Are you, you know, trying to help us charitably get inside the mind of the opponent? Or are you offering a, a, a claim that's supposed to support your thesis? Or are you just illustrating your thesis? You're not arguing for it. Or you're um, making a distinction, drawing a distinction that's going to set up arguments later. Like, I usually tell my students, I, I give them the advice to like, sometimes talk like a robot. Be a little pedantic. Um, be a little bit on this order of, I'm going to make it explicit. You might be able to pick up on what's going on here. Like, you can connect the dots, but I'm going to tell you what I'm intending to do with this. Um, uh, to make it explicit what speech acts you're performing. That really helps with communication, especially when you're having a complicated or abstract theoretical debate like happens in philosophy all the time. Um, but that might be apply, uh, applicable advice outside of just philosophical debates too. Um, but letting someone know what you're up to and why you're doing what you're doing. I was actually just talking about that with the student before class about how to communicate effectively in context of disagreement um, to make sure you know like your audience doesn't get the wrong impression about what you're doing. Um, they might have different understanding of the conventions for behavior. Like we've talked about with what counts as respect in a, in a debate. Um, like if you give an objection to someone, you might be like, and by giving you that objection, like I'm not arguing that you should be shoved out of this conversation or that you're stupid or something like that. It's not intended to shut you down. I'm actually really interested to hear what you have to say. That kind of clarification to make those speech acts um, like really overt, I think is a good communication skill. But anyway, I'll leave it at that. This lecture has been long enough, especially for those of you in the chat. Thanks for surviving this whole time. We had a lot of interruptions and technical difficulties. So I really appreciate you being here. Um, uh, thank you for your presence. Any questions or comments uh, from the chat before I wrap this up? Okay, so... Um, Valentina asks, on homework assignment problems, how deep of analysis are you looking for? Are there any word limit? Is it better to provide precise answers or detailed ones? That's a really good question, especially for critical thinking, because um, there, part of critical thinking is being detail conscious and, de and having a high level of detail to your analysis, but also recognizing what stuff matters and what stuff maybe doesn't matter. Um, there's a certain diminishing returns on details. And being able to make um, informed judgment calls about what's really significant or central to an analysis is crucial. Um, at this stage in the game, we haven't yet got to um, the kind of thing where this would be relevant. That's going to happen here with question five. What generates implied meaning? So you have to explain that uh, for a lot of those homework problems and on the exam. And that's going to be an answer that's more like a paragraph. Um, these questions, these first couple questions are like just short, right? Like this one will just be like one, a one-liner of what they could have said instead. This might just be a couple words, a couple verbs to describe what happened. Um, but once we get into how the implication is generated, that's where it's going to get complicated. I don't have a word limit on it, um, but I, I encourage you to kind of think about a balancing act here. And this is something we'll want to recalibrate. So if you want to show me some of your answers and I can give you some feedback about them, like you should be more detail conscious here or maybe this is too much. I mean, it, for the most part, it's not so much there isn't so much as being too detailed, it's about irrelevant details. So making sure that your analysis is putting the most central stuff that's significant for what you're explaining, in this case, how the implication is generated, um, and then treating secondary, tertiary things as, as not deserving as, as, of as much attention unless they're making a bigger impact, in which case they'd be primary factors. Um, so uh, definitely for explaining how the implication is generated, a big beefy paragraph is going to be required, but I'm going to give a lot of help with this. When in the lecture we're going to have on Thursday, I'm going to give you kind of a checklist of how to how to check up on your own answers for this kind of thing, uh, your own explanations, to know whether you've done everything that you need to do, and that sets a mandate for like what details need to be included and which ones maybe don't. Um, so I'm going to have a ton of advice on that. I'm not going to say more about it right now. That'll be probably maybe half of our lecture on this material next time I see you on Thursday. I, den I generally find students when they're doing their homework problems for the first time in this class give way too short of an answer. So uh, probably err on the side of more rather than less. But I'm, I, like I said, I'm going to give you much more detailed specific advice and instruction 
about what, what you need to be doing. You got something, Neil? Okay, okay, cool. Last chance to dance. Anything else there? Okay, cool. You're very welcome. Again, thanks for being here. I uh, hope to see you again. All right, I will bid you adieu. See you on Thursday or on YouTube sometime in the future.